Welcome to Word of Mouth, where dentists talk about how oral health is related to overall health, which is also known as the oral systemic connection. Although it might seem obvious that dental conditions and materials interact with the entire human system, there is a clear need for the mainstream medical community, policymakers, and the public to be educated about this reality as shown in recent research. That's why the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, the IAOMT, bring you this podcast. The IAOMT strives for safer dentistry and a healthier world. Learn more about the IAOMT and the oral systemic connection at www.iaomt.org. The information provided on this video is not intended as medical advice and should not be interpreted as such. If you seek medical advice, please consult with a healthcare professional. Also, the information in this video represents the thoughts of the individual speakers and the views expressed in this interview do not necessarily reflect the views of the IAOMT, its individual members, its executive committee, its scientific advisory council, its administration, its employees, contractors, sponsors, or any other IAOMT affiliates. This podcast is sponsored by Zeramex. Zeramex is the leading Swiss-made, completely metal-free ceramic dental implant. The first of its kind to function surgically and restoratively like traditional metal implants. The Zeramex XT system is tapered for high primary stability and uses a narrow, metal-free carbon fiber screw to secure the abutment and crown directly to the implant. Welcome to Word of Mouth. I'm Stuart Nunley, and uh, I'm the past president, one of the past presidents of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, and uh, for many years chaired the Jawbone Osteonecrosis Committee of the IAOMT, and it's an incredible privilege for me today to introduce to you Jerry Bacot. Jerry um, is the foremost uh, pathologist in the world in the area of jawbone uh, pathology and he ha has had an amazing career where interestingly enough it's hard to believe but has published over 300 uh, peer-reviewed articles and has uh, many many other chapters and so forth and textbooks and is one of the uh, co-authors of, of the most widely used textbook on jawbone pathology uh, in the world and so it's a great privilege I'll have to say now that uh, in dentistry Jerry Bacco is one of my is one of my true heroes so Jerry it's a privilege to have you here today and I I want to uh, I just thank you for all you've done for dentistry and for this world of jawbone pathology and I want to ask you uh, how on earth did you, as a pathologist, become interested in uh, jawbone pathology? That's a good question. Uh, oral pathologists are very interested in tumors and cysts in the jawbones, but not bone marrow problems. And that's kind of what I've gotten into, is studying bone marrow problems. And I have no idea where the interest came from, but uh, in my residency, it led me to apply for a fellowship at the Mayo Clinic under pretty much the world authority on bone pathology. And it turned out that uh, he accepted me. He thought it was so cool that a dentist would want to come and, and um, be, be his fellow. And he had a really good attitude and he just stimulated my interest so it never did stop. What makes jawbone pathology unique or what makes the jawbone unique? from other bones in our skeleton? Well, that's uh, something I've been putting together for maybe decades by now, but I, um, <clears throat> I have a PowerPoint module where I put, on, put down 22 different unique features of the jaw bones, but I think relative to this topic, uh, one of the most unique things is that we pull teeth and uh, we just, th we have the saliva and all the bacteria from the mouth and it has to get into the socket and um, decades later we have chronic inflammatory and low blood flow problems in those sockets. 
And that is not something that happens in any other bones. So uh, another thing is uh, no other bone really has vasoconstrictors put next to them all the time. And if you have a poor blood flow problem, uh, that might be what sets the, the painful part of the patient's experience off. Um, it, it's one explanation for the person who comes in for an occlusal restoration and then they call a day later, two days later, and say, my jaw really hurts now and it didn't hurt before I went to your office. This would be one explanation. They were borderline uh, blood flow patients and um, that's another very unique thing. The, the inferior alveolar artery in the, in the mandible has been studied pretty extensively in, in cadavers as well as a few uh, surgical cases or papers. And it's amazing we even have a jaw <laughs> because the mandible in particular, it's, um, the arteries are routinely, as we got, get older, they're routinely, they're constricted, they become tortuous. Um, some of them become fiber scar tissue. There's no blood in them at all. And uh, I've seen, even in living people, cases where there was no artery at all. And yet they think they're fine except for this pain in their jaw. So they still have apparently an, an intact nerve. There must be collateral nerves that take over the job uh, because they, they, they have the normal neural sensations. Um, when you give them a mandibular block, their lip will go numb. Um, and they, the blood vessels, the corollary blood vessels must also fill in for the, the, the work that was being done by that big artery. So for the benefit of our audience, I want to, um, and as a practicing dentist, I want to explain what uh, Dr. Bacot means by this use of vasoconstrictors, and that is that we as dentists, especially when we're doing surgery, uh, like to operate in dry fields. In other words, we'd like to have as little blood flow as possible. Uh, and yet, that only compounds the problem in a bone that has um, an insufficient blood flow to start with. So here we are, we're doing surgery in, uh, let's say it's in the lower jaw, the mandible, which has a restricted blood flow. We use an anesthetic, which contains epinephrine, a vasoconstrictor. We shrink the blood flow down, and now we're trying to get a healing result from our surgery. It may be from the ext extraction of a tooth, or as you say, it might even be in the case of doing a filling on a tooth where we've numbed up the area. We've used anesthetic that has this really quite potent vasoconstrictor in it. It shrinks the blood vessels down. The pur purpose of it is to make the anesthetic last longer, but also to have less bleeding. But you're saying that compromises the effect of our surgical procedure. It does. And um, I think in a normal, somebody with normal blood flow, that would be not an issue. Um, because vasoconstrictors are designed for so-called normal people. But in people who are maybe above 50 years of age, um, almost all of them have a compromised blood flow in the mandible. So that would be an issue, and there are people who have problems with extractions and surgery later on in life. Uh, the, the vasoconstrictor is, as I understand it, they're pretty much all designed to reduce blood flow by about 75%, and maybe for 40, 60 minutes, maybe a little longer. If you were, some people I found out when I was in Houston put cocaine in their mouth because it gives them a very nice high, they, they, they say. And I didn't know this was being done, but I would talk to them. And uh, they would have osteonecrosis. I diagnosed, uh, wrote the first paper on cocaine osteonecrosis of the alveolar bone. And uh, cocaine uh, decreases blood flow by 95% for three or four hours. So uh, there is, they can survive that. <laughs> so I, I would imagine our vasoconstrictors are survivable unless you have this problem to start with. And there's a second problem with vasoconstrictors. When the, the vasoconstriction goes away, then all these, you know, these compounds, oxyradicals that are uh, 
pretty toxic in large numbers. They're necessary for our body, but they're toxic in very large numbers. And as blood comes flowing back into the mandible, it releases major amounts of the um, oxy radicals. So it could be if you have a partially okay jaw, that could be one of the things that makes it a diseased jaw. Let's talk a little bit more about this idea of problems after, for example, an extraction. We, um, we hear this term cavitation, um, especially among physicians who refer to us as dentists. It's very common for a physician to refer patients uh, to dentists for treatment of cavitations. Can you explain this whole notion of cavitation and maybe other terms that are used in the scientific literature to describe a cavitation? Well, yeah, sure. In the scientific literature, actually, the word cavitation is very specific. And for 80 years or so, it has meant simply a hollow space in bone that is larger than five millimeters. Um, that's been a definition forever. And they developed that definition for diseases of the hip and the knees. And um, that was... I thought that was the way I was using it all along until I started getting biopsies in the 80s from dentists and they called these cavitations. And I assume they meant hollow spaces. But if you look at ischemic bone disease, only about a third, maybe even only a fourth, actually produce a hollow space. The rest of the time they produce, I call it honeycomb bone, where the marrow kind of disappears slowly and leaves the bone behind. And the bone microscopically is alive, but the marrow's gone. And I call it honeycomb bone, but that's the kind of thing you, you just touch it with a curette and it just dissolves under your touch. And then there are the others that uh, I think the predominant uh, presentation from my understanding is this brown mushy material. Um, so cavitation, I found out my mistake fairly early on by people who were talking to me, general dentists who were doing this surgery, and, and they were using the term repeatedly. And I finally asked somebody, what do you mean by cavitation? And they meant all types of ischemic or low-grade inflammatory disease. And um, I tried to get away with that or from that by making up a new name. <laughs> And uh, all my patients had had neuralgia-like pain. So the name I made up was NICO, N-I-C-O, Neuralgia-Inducing Cavitational, for the hollow space, osteonecrosis. And I used cavitational not because it was so common, but because the only disease I could find in bone from extensive reading that would produce hollow spaces was the ischemia, the slow cutoff of blood flow. So I've learned to live with it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get anybody to not use the word cavitation, but um, I have come up with a classification system, microscopic classification system, and one of the diagnoses is ischemic osteocavitation, just to make it sound a little more scientific. <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't bother me anymore. I, I know what people are talking about. Well, the term NICO is one that really, um, which you coined, um, is really quite popular among dentists and physicians. And we know that that typically refers to a lesion in the mandible that's produce, producing a painful response in the trigeminal nerve. Could you just describe for us a little bit about that lesion and in terms of why do you why does it why does it produce such an uh, intense pain? Well, uh, I want to preface by saying we don't know for sure, but um, ischemic bone disease, the the sort of umbrella term for all the various types of ischemic bone and bone marrow uh, that I've been using as a microscopic uh, name is chronic ischemic bone disease. I think NICO is fine for a clinical name in a pain patient, but about a third of patients, regardless of where in the body this ischemic bone marrow problem is, uh, 
about a third of patients never have any pain. And there are lots of examples in the orthopedic literature where the first sign that there was a problem in the hip was when the hip got so mushy it collapsed. And that's pretty severe disease <laughs> to go that far. So in the jaws, um, uh, I've run into a lot of biopsies. They look the same in pain patients as they do in non-pain patients. So there's no way I can identify one way or the other. But in the jaws, we have something really, really, really unique. We have the only bones in the human skeleton that have large sensory nerves inside them. And of course, it's there for the teeth. But once the teeth are gone, these nerves remain uh, in place. And so you take a, a nerve, a sensory nerve, and you put it in an environment that's pretty toxic. And uh, ischemic osteonecrosis, as well as chronic osteomyelitis, both have the ability to destroy the bony wall around the nerve canal. So now you have a bare, exposed nerve essentially floating in the sewage. <laughs> uh, that's one way to, somebody described it for me. And I think the nerve can survive for some time, but the insulation around the outside, the myelin sheath, that breaks down. And once it breaks down, the signals just go shooting up in big bursts. So I think uh, that's not a process that the other bones have to deal with. And if you think about the term neuralgia, I, I once read uh, the most popular textbook of pain, maybe 20 years ago this was, and in the chapter of neuralgia, the first sentence was 85% of all neuralgias occur in the face. And you have to wonder why that is. <laughs> um, plus the trigeminal nerve, is that's a doozy of a nerve. It's of all the processing power our brain does to interpret outside signals, 40% of that is going just to interpret signals from the trigeminal nerve. So in terms of size, it's not all that big, but uh, it is in terms of function. Well, we know that the trigeminal nerve, which is one of the 12 cranial nerves, is the largest, and it, it um, obviously can become very inflamed. I'm still curious, and I think this has been pondered for years in the literature, why and how could we have these intrabony lesions or cavitations how could we have them and they not hurt? That I don't know. <laughs> um, the, the only thing I can think of is the body is somehow able to wrap a little bony band-aid around an area that is partially destroyed in order to protect the nerve. Um, we know that it does that around uh, dental infections, for example. Maybe it'll do it around the nerves, but I've not seen that study I had that uh, same question, and so I asked a friend of mine to send me some cadaver mandibles, and it took many years for him to gather enough, but um, we have uh, 66 of them, and I've cut them and looked at them microscopically and grossly, and they're all people who died in the hospital, and we don't know if they had jaw pain. I, I would assume that very few would have had jaw pain, but uh, it was almost 40% of them had uh, some disease in the bone marrow of their mandible. And that I think, I think we just have this very susceptible bone to poor blood flow issues. And if you take somebody like that and give them a disease that makes their blood kind of low nut nutrient, and low oxygen, because they're getting chemotherapy, they've had a stroke, they've had a heart attack, those kinds of issues. I think that just makes the problem in the mandible even worse. Do you have a feeling, um, now that you have had the opportunity, opportunity to re review those cadaver mandibles and many others I know that you've looked at over the years, do you have a feeling for how the pathology in the mandible might impact our systemic health and vice versa. It sounds like maybe you're, you're, you feel like the systemic health or the degenerative diseases cer could certainly impact um, 
these lesions and the cause of the lesions in the mandible, but do you think the other is true as well? Well, uh, I think about 95, 96% of those lesions I found in those cadavers were in areas where teeth had been extracted, presumably a long time ago. So there's some effect that way. If they hadn't had those teeth extracted, my assumption is, without great proof, that they would not have gotten these lesions. But also a friend of mine, Hans Lechner, in Germany has, in Munich, has specifically been looking at um, cytokines, inflammatory mediators, cells that are locally produced and spill into the bloodstream. And uh, he has been finding pretty high levels uh, with names like Rance and Rankle. And uh, we're finding they, they're, they're just, they're, they're sort of like the oxy radicals. They're good in a small number, but if you spread them out into the body in large numbers, it could have some systemic effects. I believe he's found that rants, uh, which is one of the cytokines that he's found associated most often with these cavitation lesions in our jaw bones, he also has seen associated in high numbers with various systemic diseases yeah. and cancer. Exactly. Yeah. And it's uh, those, the rants and rankle have both been found in high numbers in spinal cord. Uh, fluid in people with um, dementia and things of that nature. Well, mo especially trauma, brain trauma, like the football players. So the problem with those kinds of compounds or chemicals is the more research that comes out, you find out that we're all dealing with these things all the time anyway. And we're even finding them in some cancers. So the significance of it, I mean, you have to start somewhere. You have to find them, and, but the significance of it, I think, is still in the future. One of the things that we find surgically when we <clears throat> open up these areas and begin to cure it out, um, this, the contents, is we find that they often look um, fatty. We, we, of course, know that the marrow or the medullary bone, cancellous bone, is, does have fat in it, but this is uncharacteristically fatty. Can you describe why that would be? And the fat bubbles also, if a cluster of them together die at the same time because their blood supply got shut off, then they become liquid all close together and they make a large bubble, big enough so you can see it. It's, uh, somebody described it as chicken soup, the mm -hmm. bubbles on the top of chicken soup. Um, that, that, I think, can be explained in a couple of ways, um, and I can only use the hip literature to do that, but they assumed that um, something was causing fat necrosis, and uh, it was a localized process because you wouldn't have the whole femoral head or hip joint involved. It would just be a little area here, and then there's normal marrow, another area here, and a lot of it is fairly close under the cortex. But um, they tried for decades to create an animal model that could produce that, and they could not. Uh, they thought it was from fat embolism. It just got a piece of fat came from somewhere else in the body and got stuck in the, the uh, marrow. And then back in the early 90s, uh, we had finally enough tests so people could look at, uh, they're not really clotting diseases. They're called hypercoagulation states or hypercoagulable states. And it just means that you've inherited a tendency to throw clots faster than other people. And, um, and this paper in the hip found that uh, something like 80% um, or 73% 70, of their hip cases had these clotting disorders. And we only could test for six of them back then. Now we know of 18, but uh, so we're, the studies in the hip are up to about 80%. But I called the guy who did the original research and went to visit him in Cincinnati. And I said, can you do this same study on jaw patients? We'll just send the blood to you and you do your whatever you've done before. And uh, he was gonna throw me out because I was a dentist, literally. Mm -hmm. he, he told me we became friends and he told me that after we became friends. <laughs> but I had, um, I went to him and uh, I, he was going to refuse and I said, we'll pay for it. 
uh, the patients won't pay, we'll, we'll pay. And uh, so he did, he did about 50 of those. He looked at the clotting disorders and he called me one day and said, what the blank are you sending me? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, 73% of these people have clotting disorders. <laughs> Where they were hypercoagulable. <laughs> hypercoagulable, yes. yes. And uh, I just laughed and I said, isn't that what you found in the hip? I think it's the same cause. So now uh, the, the literature pretty well supports the fact that these are people who, and about 6% of us have these, people who have a tendency to throw clots more readily and these are small clots. These aren't diseases that uh, throw big clots. So you don't get heart attacks from them. But the bone marrow and the brain are very susceptible to it. So you may have strokes and hip replacements in the history. Um, but that's, um, there are, there's now an animal model. They, they use, um, they create an arthritis reaction and then put corticosteroids in a pig and they throw, they get hot osteonecrosis of the hip. Uh, over half of the time. So the animal model has to do with thrombosis or clots as well. So, and, and I've had people who uh, I sent them to a hematologist who put them on blood thinners. And um, that is, they, they're out of pain because of the blood thinner. Interesting. What about the, what about the use of antibiotics to treat these sorts of lesions in our jaw bones? Well, most of what I diagnose uh, from the biopsies from the jaws is um, ischemic or blood flow problems. But it's very similar microscopically to inflammation. And so, uh, and I say, I would say maybe 20, 25% of my cases I diagnose as just inflammation. And um, if I have, I've seen, several hundred patients um, before they have this surgery and refer them out to people. And I used uh, antibiotic treatment as kind of a diagnostic tool. If they got a little better, then I assumed that there's an overtone of osteomyelitis or inflammation. If they don't get better after a month or six weeks, then I would assume that this is purely a blood flow problem. And I would like to use that, and some people are using the blood thinners as the same kind of a diagnostic tool. We took, uh, we did a study with about, again, about 50 patients with jaw pain, and we gave them blood thinners. And uh, this fellow in Cincinnati picked out the appropriate one for whatever their clotting problem was. And uh, I think it was 45% of those, uh, the pain either went totally away in their jaw or was dramatically improved just with the use of blood thinners. But the doses we were using, you couldn't sustain them more than a month or so. They would have been dangerous. One thing that has occurred over the last 10 years is the use of um, DNA to study and identify bacteria that are viruses too that are within these lesions. We've found a broad array of various bacteria. Would that surprise you in any way that we see no, these no. anaerobes? I, I think actually the bacteria might be part of the initiating event. Um, if you have a, an inflammation in bone and healing of a socket is kind of an inflammatory process, in a susceptible person who say has these hypercoagulation states, then it might be that the response of the bone tissue to that bacteria is what leads to this essentially a permanent or constantly recycling poor blood flow. And there are several studies of chronic osteomyelitis in jaws and in animals that show that it does exactly that. If you have it for a long period of time, the blood flow through that area is tremendously diminished and then you put it in one of these 6% of the people who have these, this clotting issue, and it just makes matters worse. So in other words, those patients would be predisposed to a greater incidence of blood clots elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you throw a clot in the jaw and, and it could go somewhere else, or you could have all of these inflammatory mediators spilling into the bloodstream and the person's whole body has this 
coagulation issue. So could you could throw a clot anywhere. But those studies have not been done. Uh, um, that that's just something that has to be done. Until about 30 years ago, even in the hip literature, uh, osteonecrosis was considered so rare that it was just rare was the word they use for it. And now, uh, hip replacements um, probably one third to one to 40 percent of all hip replacements are for osteonecrosis. What other bones in the body are prone to have osteonecrosis other than the jaws and the hip? The hip is very susceptible because it has a blood vessel going in to the end of it or near the end and it gets kind of crimped off when you put a lot of weight down in a certain way. The knees, I think just because of pure, all the weight that they have to hold up are susceptible and the lower spine is susceptible. Um, this is a funny disease because until the 70s or 80s, there were lots of papers in the orthopedic literature, but it was under 72 different diagnostic names because all the papers were written by surgeons and mostly in Europe. And uh, the tradition there was if Dr. So-and-so was the first to write about a, a disease, then we call it Dr. So-and-so's disease. And so we had out of those 72 names, about 50 of them were some doctor's name. And then I came along and a couple of medical pathologists came along about the same time and looked at the tissue and said, hey, this is all the same disease. <laughs> so every bone is susceptible, even the small bones of the fingers. But um, now we know it's all just one disease. In, in recent times, a, n a number of adjunctive therapies have been proposed in terms of treating these lesions in the mandible. We, we know that we can surgically go in and treat these areas or the maxilla, but um, other things have been proposed as well, ozone being one of those. Can you, can you list some of those other adjunctive treatments? Well, the ones I, I know about, I know about ozone because um, a bunch of my biopsy service contributors, uh, many of whom have become lifelong friends, uh, they have used it and they, have, they claim to have great success. I don't know of any study using ozones and that's gotta be done sooner or later. I, have, um, I had heard of people using low level laser therapy and I, was um, asked to do a research project by somebody who used those low-level lasers and he had developed an array of LED lights so that the patient could just sit at home and watch TV while this, um, the LED light at the right wavelength went right through the, the alveolar bone. And I told him, he was from Canada, and I told him on the phone, I think, I don't know anything about this kind of therapy. It, is kind of like voodoo. And he said, would you read some papers if I sent them to me, to you? And so he sent me about 80 Xerox copies of articles. And that got me interested. And there's, there's just so much research, especially coming out of the veterinarian field, because they've been using this since the 1960s. And uh, there's a lot of science behind it. Um, if you send the light at the right frequency through bone, it stimulates new bone formation new bone cells, uh, it opens up blood vessels, gets more f blood flowing through it. Uh, any inflammatory cells in the area, they become more successful, I guess you could say, activated. It does a lot of good things for the healing process and that is something specifically that's been looked at in some bones, uh, not necessarily the jaw, but if you hit it with this low level light therapy, then um, it, will move an inflammatory process on into the healing phase. And so it must be stimulating fibroblasts and other, other aspects as well. So that's something that uh, I, I finally became familiar with and uh, he said, you're willing to do that project now? <laughs> and so I said, okay. And uh, he treated the patients. Uh, these were sites where teeth had been gone for a long time. They were gonna put an implant in.
And we use quantitative ultrasound, which is designed to find essentially ischemic bone rather than inflammatory bone. And we, we did the quantitative ultrasound tests uh, in the area they were going to do the uh, implant in. And then uh, we used his array of LED lights and just hung them off of a pair of glasses right over where, wherever the site was. And um, they, they just, we, we just kind of made up numbers. Uh, we told the patients, uh, use it for 20 minutes for four weeks. <laughs> And in the laser therapy business, um, you take, take a break every once in a while. So we told them not to use it on weekends. So we were flying by the seat of our pants, but the, the results came out pretty dramatic. Uh, we found maybe a third of these sites were, in fact, either low bone density or dry bone or hollow bone. And uh, we didn't, that was from quantitative ultrasound. We didn't do any biopsies. But then we did the ultrasound after that treatment, and um, we had to grade the ultrasound on a four-point scale. We had to make up a scale. There was a lot of, I felt like the Wright brothers, you know, <laughs> starting from scratch. But we had a lot of um, high-grade lesions that went to very low grade or even zero, uh, just using that very painless uh, type of therapy. So I know, I mean, that I think it's because of increased blood flow more than anything else. And uh, Boyd Haley, with his, um, the material that he's been researching, he, he mentioned today, he thinks increased blood flow is the key. So um, uh, there have been other people. I've had uh, some people who would inject colloidal silver, but I've had also a couple of patients, uh, not my patients, but a couple of docs call me saying, I put that colloidal silver in and the pain went skyrocketing and it was much worse than before. Um, I've had people open them up and put um, uh, the platelet-rich uh, materials in there. Uh, it could be just all by itself, the blood products, or it could be mixed in with uh, a bone artificial bone, either human or cow bone. And they claim that that is much better. Uh, I also have a fellow who is using um, electromagnetic waves. Uh, there's a Beamer company in Germany that makes a strap that you could just lay over your face and uh, he said that that has helped uh, get rid of the pain all by itself. So we're no, talking, no and so we're talking about in these lesions, these would be those lesions that have caused a, a neuralgia and a painful, a yep. painful site. And so, whereas we know most of them are not painful. And it's hard to test that because you don't, what is your success? Uh, at least with pain, you have an, a very obvious success um, marker. Uh, Hans Lechner in Germany has the blood studies and um, there are, uh, I mentioned with those head traumas, they use the, the same markers in the cerebral spinal fluid and they can test before and after some treatment. But we just haven't got, gotten to that point yet. Well, in recent years, we have a new phenomenon and that is a, uh, there are certain classes of drugs now that we know can cause also ischemia and jawbone and even up to the point of people losing segments of their jawbone from, um, from pathology and uh, certain classes of drugs, those being primarily the bisphosphonate drugs and also a newer class, the denosumab drugs. Can you describe those lesions for us? Well, they're completely different uh, from the ones that I have studied myself. Uh, the ones I've studied, there may be a, an intense pain produced, but the surface mucosa looks perfectly normal. And that was throwing me off initially because if you have, when I was thinking it was all osteomyelitis, you should have some redness on the surface or some kind of swelling, some change on the surface, and I didn't see that. And also, um, there's never any exposed bone, whereas the bisphosphonate and other medication types of osteonecrosis, that's by definition, you have an area, 
where the bone is exposed. Usually it's after you did some surgery, you, you extracted a tooth, but it doesn't have to be. 10-15% uh, of them is just spontaneous. And I, I do believe that that's osteonecrosis, but I have yet, in literally hundreds of biopsies that I've looked at, and all kinds of articles, I've yet to see a microscopic picture that was osteonecrosis. It's always osteomyelitis. There are dead pieces of bone, but they're calling it osteonecrosis, and we used to call those uh, bony sequestry. Um, we knew it was dead, but we wanted to, I think that terminology came along to kind of say this is not an osteonecrotic event. But now there have been a couple studies of the bone away from that exposed bone. They, so they dig deep and they find chronic osteomyelitis and ischemic osteonecrosis. So I think the people who get that, and I'm just guessing here, are those who are susceptible. And nobody's looked at their clotting factors. Um, but I think they're people who have not very good blood flow to begin with, and then they're given these drugs, and they're the ones who get in trouble. And uh, there's, I'm glad that that disease came along because it uh, allowed us to study the jawbones, physiology and, and uh, even histology of jawbones in much more detail than we ever cared to. And that's helped me in my studies and understanding, but it, um, it's really not, it doesn't help the, the so-called NECO and the, the silent NECO or pain-free pain types of bone marrow diseases that I've been looking at. Those drugs in particular, the bisphosphonates, have an 11-year half-life. And can you, can you tell a difference in the way the, uh, can you tell a difference in the way the lesions look under a microscope with these sorts of, with this sort of pathology, as opposed to, say, for example, that that you find in Nico. Uh, well, there again, I have a problem because the bone that is taken out of those, it's all infection, and there's no even if I look on what I assume is the edge, it's not really Nico type of ischemia, ischemic bone. The couple papers who have looked maybe a centimeter away from where the damaged bone is, they have found ischemic bone. But I don't see it microscopically, so I am i couldn't tell from looking at a biopsy if somebody's been on those drugs or not, um, if they haven't got exposed bones. So, uh, I mean, you can look for the hydroxyapatite, uh, they can make, uh, that's what the drug sticks to. You can make an antibody to the drug and find it using immunostains, but not through routine bone stains. What do you see now as the future for us as dentists and for our patients in terms of, in terms of being able to identify um, maybe to identify more accurately these sorts of lesions, hopefully before they turn into a painful type of lesion, before they, hopefully even maybe before they predispose someone to clots other, in other places in their circulatory system. What do you see for us in the future? I don't see, unless it's a long distance ahead, us having a nice simple blood study that would routinely identify one of these or more of these 18 clotting disorders. It's, each test is a couple hundred dollars and it just gets too expensive uh, to do it as a screening technique. So I think it's up to dentists to just look with different eyes. We look at um, radiographs uh, in a way that we're used to a lot of odd looking bony tissue, really. And uh, if the patient's not in pain, we don't even think about it. But if we see an area that is just somewhat low bone density and the cone beam CT scans show that much better, I think we just have to think about bone marrow diseases instead of teeth as a cause of pain or an odd radio peg or radiolucent, I mean, uh, area. And we're just used to thinking of pain, tooth, pain, tooth. 
and you test the teeth, you might do endodontics, you might extract the teeth, the pain's still there. And even then, we don't think of bone marrow. <laughs> um, if it's an upper jaw, we might think of a sinus causing pain, sinus problem, but it's just, we have to change our mindset. And I was just as guilty as anybody else until I started seeing a bunch of these patients. I never thought about it. But now I mentioned in my lecture earlier, if you see, have a radiograph and you see the outline of an old extraction site and a, it's still there, that's abnormal. There's no way that can possibly be a normal area of bone. And the thing most likely to not allow that good healing would be poor blood flow. So that would be a sign. If you want to put an implant in a site like that, maybe you th should think twice about it. So, I mean, there are special tests, uh, bone scans, scintigraphy is supposed to be a very good way of looking for um, bone marrow diseases like this. Um, the quantitative ultrasound is probably the best. The radiologists are now identifying one of the ischemic bone diseases called bone marrow edema. They can look at an M on an MRI and the pattern in this nice round ball, if it's got the right pattern, they will diagnose it and there's never a biopsy until the hip is replaced and then they look at the final product. Uh, so we're not even diagnosing most of the osteonecrosis anymore. What about this whole uh, idea of using ultrasound? We had ultrasound available to us. Most of those machines have gone by the way. Yeah. And um, we, we're we hearing now that ultrasound may be available to us again in the very near future, both from uh, Dr. Lechner and Germany and another source in, in the UK. Um, did you find that particularly beneficial in the past? Oh, tremendously so. I didn't know that until I gathered all the data and actually looked at, at um, the uh, studies or analyzed the data. But it was not quite perfect, but almost perfect uh, in identifying where the disease is. The, the problem with um, ultrasound of all types, uh, using it in the mouth, you can't have any air spaces. And you're sending the signal from out on the face and it has to go through the, the vestibular area. So you have to fill that up with some kind of a gelatinous material. Aloe vera is what people have been using. But it's messy and it's kind of technique sensitive. So if the technician messes up in one area, you might have a false positive. But um, with those caveats, um, it's, it's a really, really, it's perfectly safe. It's a wonderful technique. No radiation in that technique and uh, should, um, should be a fabulous adjunct for us in the future. Well, you, um, you've been an inspiration to me over the years and I'm so grateful for that's all you have, <laughs> you've contributed um, so much to the career, my career, and to that of this International Academy of Oral Medicine Toxicology. Is there any final words you might have to say about um, what it looks like going forward or what you'd have to say to our audience today? Uh, the only final thing is I would like to see somebody, maybe myself, uh, do something in the private practice setting um, that, to go in and look at the medical conditions that patients have before and after this treatment. Because so many uh, of the surgeons have told me uh, it was like a miracle. This patient had chronic fatigue, had uh, fibromyalgia, had I even had, uh, just from a simple diagnostic anesthesia injection, I twice have had people with arthritis so bad they couldn't walk upstairs. And I tested them to see uh, if the pain in their jaw went away. I didn't tell them not anything would happen elsewhere. And they walked down the stairs and up the stairs and down the stairs from my second floor office. And they came back and said, what did you just do to me? <laughs> So there, there are those connections, and we have to find those connections. And um, it's a long row ahead, but I think we have people who are willing to. If somebody like me can, in the university setting, get the 
protocol approved, uh, and then we just have people following a proper paperwork protocol, really, in private practice. It's got to be done in such a way it doesn't interfere with um, your, your time very much. And we know we have those anecdotes. Um, they abound. They abound. <clears throat> Even yesterday I gave a presentation on that very thing, just on case histories where patients have responded so magnificently to the treatment of these lesions so that we do know that the contents of these lesions can have a significant impact on our systemic health. I agree. I agree. Well, I want to thank you. You've been a marvelous guest on Word of Mouth, and um, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation today. With I, I think uh, you've had the privilege of having the world's authority on jawbone pathosis uh, here today. And thank you, Dr. Bacot, so much. You're welcome. Very happy to do it. This podcast has been brought to you by the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, the IAOMT. The IAOMT strives for safer dentistry and a healthier world. We are a network of over 1,000 dentists, health professionals, and scientists who research dental products and practices, including the risks of mercury fillings, fluoride, root canals, and jawbone osteonecrosis. We are a nonprofit organization and have been dedicated to our mission of protecting public health and the environment since we were founded in 1984. You can learn more about us at www.iaomt.org and www.thesmartchoice.com. The information provided on this video is not intended as medical advice and should not be interpreted as such. If you seek medical advice, please consult with a healthcare professional. Also, the information in this video represents the thoughts of the individual speakers and the views expressed in this interview do not necessarily reflect the views of the IAOMT, its individual members, its executive committee, its scientific advisory council, its administration, its employees, contractors, sponsors, or any other IAOMT affiliates.